Welcome to Podcetera. Each episode is a journey of discovery as we delve into topics that pique our curiosity and yours. We feature in-depth interviews with fascinating individuals who have extraordinary stories to share. I'm Renee Lego. And I'm Joelle Ludovich. And this is Podcetera. Welcome, Kelly Burkhart and Micah Thomas to Podcetera. Tell us a little bit about yourselves. Thanks for having me. My name is Micah Thomas. I use they, he pronouns. I was born in Tennessee and I was raised in Alabama. I fled, I want to say I ran away to Philadelphia when I was 19 and I have been here for over 13 years. Hi, everybody. I'm Kelly Burkhart. My pronouns are she, her. I am actually originally from Allentown, Pennsylvania, and as soon as I could move down to Philadelphia, I did (laughs) in 1996, so I'm a little bit over 25 years living in the city. Kelly, you have a really varied background. You're a filmmaker, you're a photographer, but you also work for the DA's office, so give us that... That trajectory? That trajectory. How did this all happen? First and foremost, I've always been an activist and an organizer in the city of Philadelphia, particularly through the LGBTQ community. On top of that, like around, I, w- I want to say around 2015, I met my mentor, Mo- Mobita Johnson Harrell, in her organization called the Charles Foundation about empowering young Black youth because her one son had been murdered. Unfortunately, her second son also has been murdered, both mistaken identities in two different places. But I became very impassioned by all this, right? So I've been documenting uh, Movida and her organization, the Charles Foundation, for a couple of years. And then when Larry Krasner was voted into office overwhelmingly as district attorney, I saw an opportunity to actually use my activism and my advocacy in a different way. I'll be honest, I was a little burnt out leading up to that because I had been doing a lot of photography during Hillary Clinton's presidential campaign. Anytime anything was in the region, I got the phone call, so it was fantastic. I think many people like myself also reassessed some things, and I wanted to just try my hand, and knowing that I have a lot of skills that I think transfer over, I just really learned the technique of what it means to be a victim witness coordinator and became trauma-informed certified and all the other things that we need to do in order to be able to help folks who are victims of crime. And then essentially what then happened was, because I've been in the city for so long and doing a lot of this activist work, noticing that the district attorney's office didn't have an LGBTQ liaison. And we used to have that. We had that up until 2014. Nellie Fitzpatrick, when she was at the district attorney's office, was the LGBTQ liaison. She went over to the city, not to get too much into Philly politics, but it's actually important because we're all really rooted in legacy and we're all really rooted in knowing each other. Like when Micah talks about their trajectory, we're able to cross paths through a lot of work that we did prior to where we are now doing some work for the district attorney's office. Organizers stay together, but with us not having that, I saw that as an opportunity to really try and just bring that back. And very fortunate that the district attorney is so in tune to a lot of things that go on and a lot of the crime that happens and a lot of victimizations that happen to a lot of marginalized folks in our communities. We just kept talking about it and also recognizing how the city needs someone. And on the other side of it, we want folks to come and participate in the criminal justice system, especially if they have become a victim or a witness. And that's a very scary thing. Knowing how the community likes to have a voice in a lot of these entities, we have the executive director for the Office of LGBT Affairs under the mayor. And it's very important that the district attorney's office have that again. That was my long-winded trajectory. Before we go to Micah, you're an amazing photographer. Thank you. And you've been at a lot of important events. So I'd like to ask you, Looking back on all those events, what has been for you the marquee or maybe your favorite photograph? I actually have been thinking about this as I get older (laughs) and I'm starting to focus a lot more on, you know, the work that we're doing at the district attorney's office in regards to LGBTQ justice. But honestly, I think my favorite photo is when 
In 2017, the Office of LGBT Affairs released the rainbow flag with the black and brown stripes. And our dear friend Amber Hikes was the executive director at the time, and it became a whole thing, but it became a whole thing in a way that a lot of us didn't realize it. What a lot of folks don't understand is that that wasn't just about, (laughs) oh, the rainbow flag, we're all under the rainbow flag. And it's really about having a conversation about racism that was particularly happening in the city of Philadelphia, in the neighborhood at the time. But it was also obviously a longstanding conversation that was not being had within the queer trans community. And so with releasing that, and I took this photo, it went around the world to all the publications that wanted to pick it up. It's like one of those quintessential moments, not just of me taking the picture, but actually what happened, right? Because it's like this flag raising and people are kind of celebrating, but what happened afterwards the office and our friend got a lot of threats from all types of folks. Were there any positive conversations that came out of releasing the flag with the black and brown stripes added to it? Were there any positive conversations that came out for the community? I believe on a local and then a national and international level, it definitely was conversations. I know it made me as a black trans person feel more comfortable to not just disclose, but to open up and be want to be around community that I know that I would feel safe around. You know, different areas of communities still feel silent. So I definitely know that it began the conversation of there was more work to do. And that's where I believe the movement in Philadelphia for Black Trans Liberation was held going into the pandemic and different coalitions and different organizations forming and becoming to thrive. You know, kind of on the back end of that, if we're thinking about a timeline, you know, having now black and brown organizations running the Pride Philadelphia and and the Outfest. So I think there was a whole cultural shift where black trans identities were able to hold and create Philadelphia and not be silenced. I would also like to add, though, for a lot of conversations that I was having in my sphere of my predominantly white friends, some of us are being keyboard warriors at the time, (laughs) you know, trying to sort of justify to other folks that don't get it. And then honestly, if you look at history, look at how, look at how the flag actually developed and why it actually changed. It changed because there wasn't enough ink one year. There literally wasn't enough ink, everybody. There wasn't enough pink for Gilbert (laughs) Baker to actually make the flag with all of the colors in it that He wanted to, so they changed it to make it more uniform to like the rainbow. I think now, though, what is really great about nationally, there is a much better conversation, but I do feel specifically in Philadelphia, there's still a lot of underlying, am I allowed to swear? There's still a lot of underlying bullshit that goes on. Some of the businesses, particularly some of the bar owners, in regards to how they treat various types of staff, particularly entertainers, and most of the entertainers are black and brown trans folks or black and brown folks who are queer. And so let's be honestly really poignant (laughs) because it also stems a little bit, if you've seen in the paper or seen recently online, how Moriarty is one of the local bars that is not LGBTQ, but a lot of people thought were LGBTQ friendly, put out an advertisement asking for employment and only biological males are allowed to apply. So it's kind of the same conversations that folks are trying to have now about gender as folks had had and still continually have in regards to race. We keep moving forward. When I started at the DA's office in 2018, I mean, I didn't become the LGBTQ liaison right away. I had to learn how to be really uplifting, empowering human being for victims, survivors, and and all the folks, their families who have been victimized by some sort of violence. And, you know, a lot of the stuff that we've created are in response to be able to try and break down a lot of these barriers that people just keep talking about. Like, one of the biggest issues is that LGBTQ folks do not like the police. They think that I, as someone who works for law enforcement, is an officer, you know, or fuck the police, right? Fuck the police. Even though we are law enforcement, I am a social worker don't have a social worker's degree. Mine is based off experience. And we wanted to break down those barriers. So now we engage, we brought in an advisory committee, for example, and start doing a lot of that work where the the DA is listening to community members who are on the ground. I try to be on ground as much as possible. 
I'm out in the community photographing events and parties and pride and all those things because it's important to document ourselves so we're still visible. You know, it's like all these like major things that impact is exactly like why we do a lot of the work that we do. Before we jump over to you, Mike, I don't think we actually got you to describe the exact position you do at the DA's office. So my position is the LGBTQ liaison and victim witness coordinator for the district attorney's office. I do two jobs. I'm a case manager for witnesses and their families who have to be involved in the criminal legal system, as well as if anyone does come up through one of the tools that we created who is a member of the queer or trans community and is a defendant, I just make sure I let the attorneys know that, hey, this person is part of the community. Hey, we need to make sure you're asking these questions to the public defender's office. How is their housing? Do they have food insecurities? Making queer and trans folks feel better knowing that they have a person literally inside there advocating for them. We're the only office in the country that's actually doing this. And I honestly challenge any other district attorney's office to come up and say, you know, hey, we're also doing direct victim support to LGBTQ folks. So that's part of my job. The other part of my job is being the community liaison. I'll come and speak. I do trainings across the state in regards to other advocates or therapists, lawyers who are taking various trainings to understand more about what goes on with LGBTQ folks. So it's like an LGBTQ awareness training that I put on as well as I put on with uh, another member of the office to also train the interns and the new ADA classes that come in. We have an ethics training for them that is specifically focused on this. So we're really trying to make sure that whoever enters into the criminal justice system, that people are have an education, they have competency, they understand, and they know they can reach out to me because I will be like that umbrella. One of the other things that we do is we also uplift the stories of a lot of the victims, the co-victims, their families who have experienced extreme violence. It's never good when anyone is murdered especially since a lot of the trans non-binary folks in our communities are being targeted. However, we can have some positive outcomes with that. For example, with the murder of Marquise MJ Jackson, which happened in 2022, uh, December of 2022, this actually ended up being national news because the fugitive ran across the country. We identified who it was and he got to California And something, you know, scared the crap out of him. And he essentially started driving back. His anxiety started kicking in. Stories were everywhere. It was on the news, like, you know, like all the LGBTQ publications were reporting about this, as well as a lot of national news outlets were reporting about this case, because it was just such a horrible scenario. And he started driving back and he called his attorney at one point. And his attorney said, you have to turn yourself in. And he did. He drove to the U.S. Marshals in Nevada and he turned himself in. And now we're in the stage of the pretrial. So there's some mitigation going on and doing all of like the housekeeping and things like that. And we also, you know, uplift the voices of our community members. So they're speaking. So it's not me that's always speaking. It's members of our community. It's, you know, the organizations that help support folks the families themselves, sometimes they want to talk. Sometimes they want the whole world to know what happened to their kid. Sometimes they don't. We just, we listen, we follow their lead. How did you become an advocate for the LGBTQIA plus healthcare? I accidentally got involved and I think it was the best accident. I told you I came to Philadelphia when I was 19. I came from a very religious and strict upbringing My father actually was a civil rights activist in Alabama. He still is a civil rights activist in Alabama. Um, I got to march on Selma when Bill Clinton was there as a child. I used to go to St. Jude Educational Institute. It's a closed Catholic school that was primarily for Black people. But that was one of the roads that they took when they walked from Selma into Montgomery during the civil rights movement. So I came to Philadelphia just not even looking into my identity. I had a child at an early age. I was 21 when I had him, so I kind of just went, you know, being a person to being a parent as, you know, a single parent trying to find work and go to school. And I ended up finding, 
EHMC Public Health Management Corporation, they had a workforce institute where I was able to get a health care certificate. And the reason I found out about the program is I was in a relationship that was not the best relationship. So the mother of the person I was dating actually came and basically confronted me at the doorstep. And by the time we got done having the conversation, she said, you deserve better than those people. I'm going to tell you about this program. And it took me some time, but I went through the program. It was a nine-month program. It was all Black folks who were in the program, and I got to bring my child when I was needed. And I had to do an externship to get out and graduate. I started working at a Black mental health facility called Warren E. Smith. It's in primarily North Philadelphia. They have a couple of locations. So I was the receptionist, but you never know what people are dealing with. And I never knew who I would encounter on a daily basis, but I would work hand in hand with the nurses, the doctors, you know, the executive directors and different people just to help folks have great experiences. So, you know, kind of going above and beyond, but it made me want to take care of myself. So I started going to therapy and I started utilizing tools that I needed. I was actually adopted into my family for my aunt. I am a Black trans person. You know, I've been transitioning since about 2016. And I think going through therapy and understanding work and who can get paid more in different positions really just made me understand of what type of voice am I? Because I felt as I was just a a silent, light-skinned Black woman. I know that the, you know, Black women are almost at the bottom of most of the polls that were going up ranks. So to identify as a Black trans man, I felt like I was going almost up in a hierarchy, but I realized that I couldn't just be a representative in a healthcare setting for marginalized people in marginalized communities, that there were also people like me who were not even maybe understanding that they were struggling with their identities. So I ended up leaving Warren e. Smith, and I think that was probably the longest job I had. And I went and I basically worked at Galay for 15 hours a week, $15 an hour, and didn't know how I was going to make ends meet, but I got to do community outreach and I got to meet with different people. And I don't think Kelly knows it, but Kelly used to take photos of me pre-transition when I used to go to Amber Hike parties. To have a history of me be taken from all the photos that Kelly has taken through my journey at Galay or at a protest or at a prom. I did prom this year. I went to Galay's prom this year, last year. And that was the first time I went to it, and Kelly has photos of this. So I feel like Kelly has got to capture pictures of me and my son and just, like, the whole history of me. That's part of the reason why I do some of the work that I do in the community. At Galay, doing community outreach, I moved up to operations, and I got to work alongside revitalizing a queer Latin social justice organization that was founded from leaders in our community like Gloria Esserez and David Acosta. So being able to work with a small group of about six or seven people, I love, but the pandemic happened and life happens and I wasn't taking care of my mental health, even though I separated from working in mental health. So I've been taking maybe the past three years to get myself together from addictions and things of that nature. I can say I have worked at the human rights campaign, campaigning for when Josh Shapiro was being elected and started a group in between like my transition and leaving the mental health facility and working at Galay, I was like, I just don't know where to find other black trans men like me. So I went to Instagram. You can create a, a group on Instagram that's a private, it's called Trans Mass Connect. So it started as a Facebook group page. I realized I've had that for about five years and I never really got to utilize it. I'm really just launching Trans Mass Connect and really making that not just a local thing, but that's going to be basically something that we can take all the organizations that are in small areas or big areas and just have like a web tree where we can just link all our resources together. My slogan is, how can I be of service? Coming from a very Christian background and still being in a Christian or faith spirituality space, I want to be able to service for the people of our community because somebody did it for us. And knowing that I have to have some type of legacy, it's just really why I'm here today. How did the two of you meet each other? Throughout my career as a photographer, I always made sure to show women, people of color, you know, folks that aren't always cis white gay men. And that is like the most important thing that I think I've ever done in my life, (laughs) honestly, Mm -hmm. is like making sure that everyone's voice is being heard because that's the strength in our community. 
that's visibility for everybody. You know, we don't just look like me. Thank God we don't look like me. Kelly is the only person who is going to look like Kelly. Kelly was the only person who had a camera in all of these spaces that I was going to be in 2017, 2018, 2023. So when you see a face that is at all of these things, we just were at a DVLF tour drive. Kelly didn't know I was going to be there, but I knew Kelly was going to be there. And I knew two people there and Kelly was going to be one of them. So I was going to be okay. This is the community. I didn't know that Kelly worked for the DA's office. I just knew Kelly did photos. There's only one Kelly, I feel like, in Philadelphia who was doing photos. Safest bet to do. And nine times out of ten, if you need a photo done or if you need help or directing someone to resources, I am the person who is on the ground saying, hey, Kelly, person Mm -hmm. needs, needs something. I don't know if you can help, but I just need to put it out there. There's just a web tree of history that lies in Philadelphia, and our history has been tangled into to that. And Kelly does that with the photos that they have taken at these parties. Yeah, I mean, I, I actually asked Micah to be a part of the LGBTQ Liaison Committee because I know that he does a lot of work on the ground and knows a lot of folks that I don't know but I would put money on, have probably experienced at some fashion, the criminal legal system. Like when you called me about the one client who had just found out, you know, that there was a case against them. And so I just reached out and just asked folks about what was going on and sort of some of the discovery and things like that. But I basically explained the person's scenario and said, hey, just think about this. That person then got into one of our diversion programs not everyone walks around acting like they want to commit a crime. Like a lot of times people are just caught in situations that they don't even know that it's happening at that time for whatever reason, if it's their mental health, if it's, it's just a scenario that they walk into. And oftentimes just in the city of Philadelphia, people are shooting at each other just because someone bumps someone the wrong way. I also wanted to add between when I was working in the mental health facility and before I went to Galay, this was right when Krasner got into office. Uh, December 2018, I caught a case, felony, trying to sell a dime bag of weed, you know? But I was able to go through the diversion program. I didn't owe it to Krasner or the DA's office, but I felt like I owed it to the community to say, I know none of y'all want to touch the DA's community advisory board. None of y'all want to touch it, but maybe you'll feel safe knowing that I'm here, the way that I felt safe knowing that Kelly is in these different spaces. So I think that sometimes putting yourself in spaces is so the next people can fill those voids. Could you take us through a case that you've collaborated on and how it works? Essentially, when we wanted to start an advisory committee at the district attorney's office, which is led by community voices, and there's there's a couple of prosecutors as well as myself, and we're all identified as LGBTQIA+. One of the issues that we recognize is that not everyone in our community is also going to, you know, call it in. They're not going to report a crime. They're not going to, even if they were a witness to something horrible, they're not going to do it. Essentially, we did a call out and that's when we got a handful of people from all different parts of the community. So like when we have big major media cases, they know every step of the way what's happening. And, and I, I'm trying, you know, I have, a, I have a better example. Well, OK, because I also mm-hmm. I'm trying to like not name names, but, mm-hmm. you know, to try to protect everyone. But go ahead. There was a victim. The mm-hmm. siblings were upset. We were asked if we wanted to come and stand by the DA's office in the queer community and make sure right. that all voices are heard and everyone is taken care of. But in the midst of that, the sisters, they needed consoling. And one of our community members were able to kind of take her to the side and basically, you know, meet her where she was and be able to get help so that they can move forward in healing. That's just a small instance, but it's really just about representation and just, you know, helping where people really need to be met. Because we we never know what to expect when, when we get a call. It's great when we get calls and it's not about people being murdered or people being hurt. It's knowing that there are events happening and seeing if the DA's office wants to have us table, like for pride or different things of that nature. There was a recent murder of a member of our trans community. And I reach out, if I find out someone's murdered, unfortunately, I will call them all, send them an email. We will all get together and sort of just talk it out because this is very traumatic for all of us. I'm a white, cisgendered, middle-aged lesbian. As an empath is one thing, 
but for friends of mine like Micah or some of our other members, they know a lot of the folks that are going through or the family member of this person who was murdered. We also make sure that we're doing healing among ourselves because we know like the most important thing is that we know there's going to be community members out there that are going to really be affected by this, whether they're family or not family. Everyone in the community that I'm like close with or good friends with, who I've served on the board with, who I organize with, any one of us goes down, it's like all of us goes down. You know, we're a family. It's chosen family. That's the, that's the reasoning. I may call Micah and say something like, Micah, do you mind if I ask this person to reach out to you because they are looking for housing? They also may need some clothing. They may need transportation. You know, like in a lot of our organizations have, like, for example, we had one of our, actually one of the witnesses told me that they basically didn't have anything. So I sent them over to Galay because I know they started a closet. A lot of these organizations, Attic Youth Center, like they have passes to help people get around. What our goal is to, to literally just make sure that people are connecting with the right resources mm -hmm. and that they know that there's someone that looks like me or looks like us, looks like you, who's there to talk to, to help, because it's not just about the violence that happened to that individual person. A lot of times these can be a hate crime or they mm -hmm. can be, even though that's a whole, honestly, hate crimes are a whole other can of worms. So let me know if you ever want to get into that, because the state of Pennsylvania actually doesn't have hate crime legislation. How difficult is it to prove and prosecute hate crimes against members of the LGBTQIA plus community? That's a loaded question, I guess. It's not harder anymore, at least in Philadelphia, because when these folks come in and do trainings and help out, we make sure that our staff is at least competent in, you know, language, affirmations, like all those things on top of putting up the case. And I will also give them a little bit of like, hey, this may be, this situation happened because of X, Y, and Z. For example, when a trans person was murdered, when Mia Green was murdered, a lot of people were talking about, is this a hate crime? Is this a hate crime? So in Pennsylvania, they're actually, the Pennsylvania statute is under, where hate crimes could live is under something called ethnic intimidation. Well, that has been challenged and removed. So sexual orientation, gender identity, disability, and women are not included in ethnic intimidation. When you use the word ethnic and intimidation, but what our local government or not, excuse me, what our state government did in the past is that they would just put everything under that, right? Because it, because the statute says something about groups or groups who do something against a, you know, person for a biased reason. There is legislation right now that is in the house that will hopefully someday get to the Senate in Pennsylvania that is now called hate based intimidation. And so they're trying to actually make a hate crimes act, but the big elephant in the room, or I should say not so shocking big elephant in the room is that the Republicans just block this every goddamn year. So we can't really charge for what is considered a hate crime in Pennsylvania. With the work that you do, it must take its toll on you personally. How do you deal with it? so that you don't internalize it and take on someone else's pain and tragedy? Well, the last time I was asked that question, I remember saying, I don't. And we all laughed around the room. I fell short in myself and became dependent on substances and unhealthy relationships. And I kind of had to hit the bottom. And as I'm hitting the bottom, I'm still pouring on to other people. So I think I kind of just took a break from all life. I became a hermit and I just kind of really focused on myself and what I really wanted, but I still had the urge to be around community. So I think I found balance, but I have really gotten closer in just my spiritual self and like, what am I putting into my body and who do I want to be around? For me, I actually was recently diagnosed in the last year or so with PTSD and we all have trauma. And, and I thought that I've worked on a lot of my own trauma which I did until you start working in this profession and just the vicarious trauma that exists when you're listening to a crying family member or a crying victim or someone yelling at you that you don't know my case. I've had that, that happen to me about three years ago and that will never happen to me again. I really practice a lot of self-care. 
I do therapy twice a month. I love my therapist. I actually also do facials and massages because that is also very important. That helps get my toxins out. I'll be honest, it, it really shook me when when my friend Joshua Kruger was murdered. And I know that there's been a lot of other allegations and things like that about him that he might have provoked his murder. But I will always stand on record by saying no one ever deserves to be murdered. No one ever. I mean, people need to be held accountable. Please don't ever get me wrong. But that sort of hit me a lot. And someone even asked me, are, are you sure you should work on this? Because you, you know, you know him personally. And, and I was like, you know what, that's a really good point. So I, and I, I still am. I make sure to just collaborate with the other homicide coordinator. So we're all sort of in this together. Is there support staff you can turn to or someone in your work? There are a few of us that we do talk about it. But I do talk a lot about it through therapy. And now I'm like, you know what? I'm going to do this in therapy because that's where I should be doing it. <laughs> there are a couple of social workers on staff. They're not necessarily for staff. We try to do some things to help alleviate the pressure all the time, like happy hours or like I hosted a movie night. The office tries to do some things like we'll have a really lovely luncheon for Black History Month coming up that everyone will partake in and they do it for the full office. So we really try to do a lot of support internally as well. And we do have a therapy dog that goes to court. <laughs> and so we can go see that therapy dog. That's pretty cool. I have a very faith-based structure in my life. So I attend Next Level Revival Church, which is located here in Philadelphia. It is a Black-led church. I've been going there probably for about three years now. Can you share some statistics of LGBTQIA plus either intimate partner or domestic violence? I feel that's one of the topics that a lot of people don't talk about in the queer community. And so we first started this arrest identification sheet, which essentially pulls keywords from the police reports that come through our office. So we're not tracking anyone and we're not targeting anyone. But we are able to now potentially identify folks who could be members of our community by the keywords, whether it's her girlfriend, his husband, his ex-boyfriend. You know, it's also derogatory terms. There's bar locations and nonprofit organizations that are members of the community. The biggest thing that has come out of this is that at 77%, the arrest identification tool is identifying a domestic violence or an intimate primarily an intimate partner violence situation. It was one thing that really opened my eyes to, you know, make sure that some of our support agencies and organizations are doing things for the LGBTQ community and not just having a support group for members of domestic violence, but like, are you having a queer support group? Are you able to do X, Y, and Z, you know, to help some of these folks? Because it's very difficult when the person that, you love <laughs> is harming you. And I have my own, a little bit of my own experience with that. Also just seeing what people go through. I mean, but now sometimes it comes to the point where people are shooting at each other and, <laughs> and it's just like, wow, how did we get there? But emotional too. Well, the one thing that we can't track, right? That emotional abuse is most likely prevalent. And it was probably there first before things just kept escalating. We do have a diversion program. If someone's a first time offender, they will be able to go into a domestic violence diversion program to kind of like get your stuff together, figure it out, anger management, you know, learn some tools, you know, but our top keywords is her girlfriend and her ex-girlfriend. So there's a lot happening among women in the community. I don't have a, st a statistical number, but I can definitely say that intimate partner violence in trans relationships is definitely high in our queer communities. I think that just also underlines with some of the things that are going on in each individual's life. Uh, luckily, there are resources here in Philadelphia, so if anyone needs a resource for that, and they're hearing this, I definitely want them to reach out to us. What is the DA's office doing to address the issue? What happens when the tracker comes through and, uh, and identifies a case, for example, when it comes through, there's four of us like in an Excel spreadsheet, two of us are from the data lab, two of us are victim witness coordinators. And we go in and we verify through the police database, we're able to verify if the person identifies as a member of our community or not. One of us will be, re either me or the other, primarily me, 
because the other colleague, she has her whole other caseload, but she also works in family violence, sexual assault. So I will reach out to them initially just to let them know, hey, I'm here. When I do get folks on the phone, I will mention that I'm part of the family. So I'll ask them, do you need any additional resources? Do you need any LGBTQ resources? A lot of times folks may just want to be connected to the organization near them because they just moved to the city. They just moved to Philadelphia with their partner and this person is like this, for example, and now I don't know where to go stay. So that's when I will call up some of these folks from the advisory committee and be like, hey, I have a trans person that needs housing. One of the agencies that's essentially is a shelter, any substance abuse issues that are noted or not issues, but any substance use, excuse me, any substance use noted in the police report, you know, then that gives us different opportunities to place people as well. We don't force any of our stuff on anybody. It's always the other person's choice, the victim, the survivor. It's their choice to utilize the resources that we have. Let them know that we're here. Sometimes people won't. Sometimes these cases just get withdrawn. In fact, we actually have a pretty large withdrawn record because of so many cases being domestic violence or intimate partner violence, but then no one comes to court because they got back together with their partner. The point of the work that we do is to empower folks, right? It's to empower them, it's to provide them the information, affirm them, you are not alone. Kelly, you're working on a national project on hate crimes. That's the Improving Strategies for Investigating and Prosecuting Hate Crimes, a national yet local approach. Can you tell us about it? We're doing this work in conjunction with Florida International University researchers, and they have gotten a large grant from the National Institute of Justice, which is the foundation from the Department of Justice. So it's like how people help gather information, do research, and Essentially, they will present back to the National Institute of Justice how various counties are dealing with hate crimes. So Philadelphia is one of them. The other ones, it's New York, because New York is the only place that has a hate crimes task force. Chicago, New Orleans, San Bernardino, California, and the county where Portland, Oregon is in. And so what we're doing is we are talking about a lot of the data that we've created, but we're actually ironically having a lot of major issues because they want us to send it over in a certain way. We haven't been capturing that. And a lot of other places, I mean, I don't know how they're capturing LGBTQ individuals, but we're not capturing it under the ethnic intimidation law. So what I think inevitably might happen is we're going to, our office, myself included, will probably actually help co-authoring this thing now because of what we do and what we'll talk about are the initiatives that we created forming the advisory committee, having community voice, direct connection to the district attorney, the tracker, the arrest identification sheet to make sure that we're identifying all the cases that we can, continuing on all of the trainings that we do, which actually in all my trainings aren't just, this is what lesbian means. This is what you know gay means. B means bisexual. No, it's not that. We're talking about, it's well beyond that. It's a trauma-informed care approach, speaking about pronoun usage. I actually give a very brief history of what has happened in the queer community, starting with the Lavender Scare, when they essentially, when policy started to be created to exclude gay and lesbian individuals from performing, you know, their civil service by working for the federal government. And I go from there and I talk about, you know, silence equals death. I talk about a lot of discrimination that happens during the HIV AIDS epidemic. But then we also talk about the epidemic of how a lot of trans folks, particularly Black trans women have been murdered in the country as well as internationally. It's more trans folks of color, not necessarily specifically Black trans women. That's actually a really important note. But I talked to all these coordinators about it because you need to understand that someone's going to be coming to you and they may have experienced violence and they're going to think like normally we would think of like if I got into a fist fight with someone and, you know, I have like whatever, you know, fractal, whatever on my face. But if this person is someone that called me a dyke, you know, beforehand fucked up my face, like I am scared for my life. (laughs) So I explain in my trainings, we talk a lot about what a lot of our communities face just on a daily basis. 
right? You know, you can't find jobs because people are discriminating against them and food insecurities. And when you can't find jobs and you can't really eat and you can't really afford your housing and all those sort of things, we're actually still kind of identifying it out because they wanted us to present all this data based off of ethnic intimidation, but the police, and that's always a disconnect because the police will also write ethnic intimidation because that's how they're being trained to talk about hate crimes when they're reporting incidents. We're kind of just going to be going on the fly. We will be interviewing prosecutors. We will be interviewing other support staff. We'll also be interviewing community members like the folks in our advisory committee And hopefully other jurisdictions and other counties will see this and be like, you know what, we need to find money for this. With the onslaught of anti-LGBTQIA plus legislation, especially bills targeting the trans community, what do you see as the most challenging issues facing trans people today? The common issues that we daily face are jobs that actually pay us what we need for value, or not even jobs, career paths that are actually for us. I feel like for Black trans folks, the only time they actually find a career for them is when they are finding a nonprofit to go work for, and that's primarily either in HIV healthcare or some realm of community engagement. So I have definitely seen an influx within the last decade of Black and Brown trans organizations being created, not just in Philadelphia, but all over the nation. Being able to find like-minded individuals to create these boards of directors and create these organizations and kind of find strengths to finally fight for funding so that these organizations can be funded. And then they're not just paying out for the payroll, but they're also paying into the outreach, the life skills, and the housing. We wake up every day holding our breath trying to see what we're going to do. If... We have to leave the states and the cities that we're in. Where can we get the same access to healthcare services or where can we feel safe? It's a constant, you know, knowing that all of these bills are happening and being denied because it's just going to put a struggle and a weight on us that we don't need. We're trying to survive every day and we're still trying to uplift ourselves and uplift our community. But, you know, I can go protest at the White House for these bills, you know. I wrote an article with the Kensington Voice during the pandemic talking about Title IX and talking about kids and youth being able to play sports. And, you know, that's just one type of bill. Somebody is always a target. If it's not going to be the trans folks, it's going to be, you know, marijuana rights or something like that, or gun rights. It's not a battle that's with us. It's a battle with the people who don't want to understand. If I can add, I think it's important that particularly... For us, for folks like me, folks like you all, like for white folks, we need to actually do 10 times better in helping uplift. And I don't just mean like, it's not helping, it's providing someone the opportunity to better themselves. Because what a lot of these laws are trying to do is just continually push people down as they're going through their life. Like when you're talking about kids in sports, all these kids want to do is just play sports. They just want to be who they are and they just want to play on a team. (laughs) But unfortunately... Some people see that as a threat. I mean, it's wild that bathroom bills are coming around again. I thought we resolved all this, but apparently not because God forbid, I would be more scared going into, you know, I'm very male presenting and a lot of people do call me, sir. If I went into a men's bathroom, I would be scared shitless because I'd be afraid that someone's coming after me. Like, or they would look at me like Mm -hmm. weird. Most people can understand that I'm not a dude, but at the same time, These laws are literally just to get votes, to target people and take the narrative away from whatever chaos they're doing or they have going on in their life or what they're trying to cover up. Again, like white folks, we need to be really present. We need to continue to go out and vote. We need to continue to fund a lot of these organizations that are doing a lot of this work on the ground, fending for our rights or challenging a lot of these laws in court. So like that takes money, that takes lawyers. Right. And those lawyers need to get paid. (laughs) You know, we just got to keep pushing, because if you look at history, we've gone through this ad nauseum. What's next for both of you and how can our audience learn more, be more proactive and help with LGBTQIA issues locally, regionally or nationally? Like it's not just about you paying money towards an organization, even though those dollars really help organizations and nonprofits actually do the work that they do but it's also employing people. It's also volunteering. We are all literally under attack. 
if you identify differently than what is considered the norm. I don't even know what the norm is anymore. I'm currently working at a made to measure store named Indochino. And so if you want to come see me, I can get you in a suit for over about $300. Besides that, I took a break from nonprofits to just kind of get myself together. I have not formally certified TransMask Connect. So that's really what I plan on doing and getting my board of directors and everything together so we can go further. I got a certified peer specialist certificate because of going through my recovery. So I really want to utilize that and work towards creating support groups for people who are going through recovery or domestic violence or coming out to families or stressed about these 300 bills that have been passed. You can find Transmask Connect on Instagram, transmaskmaxconnect.com. I will still continue with the photography. It's a great connection and a great side hustle, if I will. But I am hoping that I will finish finally the documentary on Gloria Casares that I started 10 years ago because it will be 10 years that Gloria has passed. But I think I'm in a really great place now where I can handle everything. (laughs) I can work through that vicarious trauma. And my goal is to have something for folks and family to look at. So we do this speed round questions where we ask each of you some fun questions. Kelly, what's your favorite film? And then Micah, what's your favorite film? I really can't say what my favorite film is because most of the time I sit here and I watch documentaries all the time. However, I will say, please go out and watch Rustin about Bayard Rustin, the biopic starring Coleman Domingo, not only because he is very worthy of that Academy Award, but also because I produced a film where he was a star in it. So that film was beautiful something. It's not for every audience, and I'm grateful to get to know him. But honestly, the biopic about how the March on Washington, the 1963 March on Washington, is so incredible, and it's so incredibly powerful. I also can't wait to watch Origin, which is from Ava DuVernay, but Rustin is incredible. Mine is very simple. I would say for folks to go see Color Purple, I don't think a lot of people know that there's a lot of queerness in the Color Purple. Go watch the old one and the new one. But no, my favorite movie is Wally. It's a movie about a robot, and it's really not just about the robot, but I think that the people in outer space on the little futon couch and we didn't have any gravity and eating. I think that's where we are headed in the society. So I just want to keep watching it so I can be the little cockroach that's still looking for the little piece of life that we yeah. have here. Don't ever call yourself a cockroach, my friend. Oh, no, no. I didn't mean it like that, you know. Um, but yeah, Wally. Who's your favorite LGBTQIA actor? Coleman Domingo. He really is my favorite. I've known and watched him grow for so long. So who's yours? There are many up-and-coming LGBT actors and actresses, but there have been a lot of Black trans actors and actresses come out. You can go check out Trans World. That is basically about four couples of trans experience, I think, based out of Atlanta. And you can find that on Tubi, I think. I'm rooting for anybody Black and trans who's an actress. And if you're queer... Laverne Cox. There's a great one. Yeah. I was going to say T.S. Madison, honestly, because she started on a podcast on YouTube, and now she's actually about to be at the Wilkinsburg Pride. Who has been the biggest influence on you in your life? I have an answer. Go ahead. Well, I say it takes a village not only to raise a child, but to raise us. So I could say Kelly has been an influence in my life. Kind of also Amber Hikes, just for the role of being a Black queer woman in the work that she did in the community while they were here. And honestly, my dad, if it wasn't for my dad adopting me and and raising me, I'm I'm like a mini version of him. There's Barbara Giddings, Gloria Casares. I mean, she's also the reason why I actually started this job because I was working on the film during that time and just like watching what she did in local government, how she really developed that program at a government level was really visionary because no one had really done it at all before. Watching them grow and and seeing how they have literally put an entire community on their back and just march forward and deal with so, so much as well as creating so much amazing space for people. Our final segment is called Question Down the Lane. We ask each guest to provide a question for the next guest. 
Our last guest has a pretty deep question for both of you. It is, what will you do today that's going to help people tomorrow, a hundred years from now, a thousand years from now? So what's something today that's going to affect future generations? I'm hoping it's the work that I'm doing right now, honestly. Having a position that is specifically for queer and trans folks to work in a prosecutor's office, because crime is never going to stop. It's never, ever, ever going to stop. As much as we want it to stop, we can make laws to try and force things to stop, but it's still not going to stop. And so we have to unfortunately be prepared for that. So it would really be fortifying the LGBTQ liaison and, and a victim witness coordinator in the office, I think w- will help generations down the line. Being able to use my voice and knowing that it's a privilege to use my voice to uplift not only myself, but others. I think that being on this podcast has helped push me to remind myself that you did the self-care work and it's okay to dive back into the community when you need to. So I appreciate being on here and pushing me to be my best self. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you, Micah, for joining us on Podcetera. Thank you. Thanks. If you enjoyed this episode, please leave a review and share Podcetera. And be sure to follow and like the series wherever you enjoy podcasts. For Podcetera, I'm Renee Lego. And I'm Joelle Lodovich. Thanks for listening. See you next time.